them from every part of the world to Digital Mental Health Live. Uh, this is our hashtag where you can at any point uh, send us a message using that hashtag and we'll try our very best to, to help you uh, and to track any questions uh, and have a discussion. So today we're broadcasting from London, England and we have uh, three guests with us and a live audience with us as well. And I'd just like to introduce the, the speakers that we have uh, with us today. Um, so Tom Insel from California, uh, MindStrong Health, if you'd like to just introduce yourself. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be with you, at least uh, remotely. I'm sorry I can't be in the room, but uh, excited to hear about the questions and to share this uh, opportunity with uh, the other hosts here that are uh, around the table. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and we have the editor of Lancet Psychiatry, Niall Boyce. Hello, I'm, as you said, the editor of Lancet Psychiatry, so I'm here as a uh, representative from the world of old media. And I'm very interested to uh, learn about what uh, digital can offer the future of psychiatry. And Sir Simon Wesley from King's College London. Hi there, I'm here to represent old. <laughs> it really it's very nice to be in this room, actually. This is Westminster School where my kids are at school. Mm -hmm. I'm normally here just to be told how lazy my children are. So uh, it's very, very nice to be doing something else. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do is, is just kick things off with a few questions to inspire you around topics that relate to psychiatry, culture, and technology. Now we have a diverse audience with us today, um, and so we're going to try and capture as many views as possible. Uh, one of the, the first perspectives, or questions rather, is on day one we collected a word cloud and we asked people what the future and what the innovation of digital mental health care would be. And surprisingly or not, that the key word, uh, the biggest word, was access. And so on that note, I wanted to ask each of the, the guest speakers from your perspective, um, how does culture, technology, and psychiatry come together? Um, how is it led and integrated by one or the other um, in order to create access? So Tom, if, if you don't mind. Well, thank you. I, I think the simple answer to your question is the device, because the opportunity to use something that almost all of us carry around in our pockets as both a way of measuring change which we call the afferent loop, and then providing interventions, which we call the efferent loop. Uh, that's pretty extraordinary. Uh, we've talked so much over the last 20 or 30 years about genomics and imaging and high tech as changing what we'll be able to do in psychiatry. But to think that what might actually make the difference is a smartphone. Currently in circulation, 6 billion expected by 2020. They're a uh, global phenomenon. There are places that have smartphones that don't have running water. And that to me says that we have a chance now to bring uh, technology at scale um, related to uh, both informing people and helping people with mental health problems uh, in a global way. Now, making sure that that flows well with the context in which people find themselves is gonna be important. And this is still much more of a promise than it is at this point of probability, I think we have a lot we need to do to make this work. Uh, but certainly that's where the access, for me, the access opportunity is because we've got what in technology they call the form factor. We've got the platform that is already ubiquitous um, and it provides this really unprecedented way of scaling to billions of people. Well, uh, what I can say as um, an editor, what technology has brought me in terms of the world of psychiatry is really genuinely hearing the patient's voice, which is something which I don't think psychiatry has always been great at. It has a history as being a sort of restrictive uh, branch of medicine, as with all branches of medicine, it's been quite paternalistic in the past. And I think what technology has allowed with social media is for us to genuinely hear and engage with the patient voice. and. Uh, Digital technology within healthcare represents the chance for a genuine form of partnership and co-production, which I think has to be the future for mental health services. 
that was quite an impressive run of cliches there in the Thank you. sentence now. Right? <laughs> I can yeah. to see. You have me, Brett. That's true. Um, my job's to be grumpy, by the way, just in case you're wondering that's why I'm here. Um, but I, I'm, obviously, access is important. And when you have a new technology, you get more access. So when printing comes to Europe, it meant that more people had access to ideas than in, when they had uh, illuminated manuscripts. That was fairly obvious. And ditto digital technology will give more people access. But, but access is actually a verb. Access to what? That's the thing. And finally, you know, I would, I would say that um, we still have the problem of what is it that we are delivering and why are we stalled in the things that we're doing. Yeah. And that's not going to change just because we have more access and better technology, but to do the same things. So until we have some nice new things to do, um, then I'm, I'm not quite sure this is quite such a breakthrough other than in the yeah. way the printing was. Well, I mean, uh, printing itself is sort of contentious because some of the sort of revisionist approach to the Reformation now in print uh, is far more based around the social networks uh, of, of Europe at the time. And printing is important, but it's not the, the sole driver. It's not I exactly economic. Yes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so there, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the parallel isn't exactly perfect, but it, 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 it is in as much as we can say that I think the technology alone, uh, you're right, that, that simply the communication technology is not enough, but we've also got to think about how we're building it and the, the social and economic networks which are structured around. Can I jump in here? Because I think Simon brings up an important point. It's for way too long we've been focused on what I call the, the quantity issue, how you get more people into care. Uh, and the fact is that at least in the best epidemiological studies, we have about 50 to 60 percent of people with mental illness, sometimes even serious mental illness, are not in care. Those numbers are quite a bit worse than they would be with uh, diabetes, heart disease, uh -huh. uh, so, so some of that you could argue is an access problem. I, I'm not sure that assumption is quite correct. Actually, I think the bigger problem than the quantity issue of access is the quality problem of what gets delivered. And one of the reasons why people don't come to care is a lot of times that they actually don't want to buy what we sell. And I think we have to think seriously about quality, about what it is that we provide, whether it's through digital platforms or face-to-face -face or any other way. And the real challenge for psychiatry is, is providing better care, care that's more effective and care that people want. It's not simply making sure that people have access to what we do today, because giving more people access, you're still going to have 60% of them who aren't going to take what we're trying to provide. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right. Um, you know, the latest EPI studies show, certainly in this country, I know this is not true everywhere, but in this country now, most people who have diagnosable mental health problems know that they do. So the era of raising awareness, as we've been talking about, we need to raise awareness all the time. It's kind of over. People are aware, and they're aware sufficiently to know that we don't have the services that, that we ought to to deliver people, and we don't always do what people like. And I'm the scout of the army. And that's a group who are quite um, unfriendly to what we do, is they show uh, they vote with their feet. They're perfectly well aware they have problems, and they're aware we exist, but they don't really think, many of them, that we, we, we can help them. OK. OK, thank you. Now, I, I want to ensure that we've got the audience's perspective on this. So if you have any comments, please come forward. And um, as, as this happens, I want to um, just make some references maybe that might be relevant um, to things such as the antidote and it's okay to talk and talk life and I'm not so sure if uh, the psychiatry community uh, how close um, network they are to these online support communities uh, who are effectively um, saying that they're being healed by the community in a very sort of qualitative artistic um, in, in a way that's it's digital and anonymous. Um, and I just wondered uh, if anyone in the audience has had any experience with these platforms and if they have helped you, if, you, if you'd like to share that. And, and also the, the power of the online community. Um, so we're talking about the clinic, but we're also, uh, we're now able to reach to an online community. So um, I, I just wanted to expand that a little bit more and um, if anyone had any points to talk about the digital community as a space. 
Okay, if not, <laughs> so <laughs> let's uh, let's marinate on that point. Yeah, um, now I'm going well to. I, yeah. well, I, so, I think I think at the moment the discussion's a little bit too broad, and that one of the things we've got to figure out is what is what what do we mean by digital mental health? Do we mean um, interventions for things which might not even come to a, a primary care in the first place? Mm -hmm. So. Um, sort of general uh, mixture of uh, mild, mild depression, anxiety, um, <clears throat> life stresses, which are sort of out there in the community and might or might not come to primary care, probably wouldn't get to secondary care. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about people who have what we might call severe mental illness, uh, mm -hmm. psychosis? Um, you know, and, and I'm not convinced that there is going to be a digital intervention for absolutely everything. I think we've mm -hmm. got to define where we think this would be useful and what we think it would be useful for, well, in rather than going wholesale. Well, just to take you up on that, what would be your your take on where we should focus on? I mean, I think right now most of the work has been on um, well, social social issues such as loneliness. I think it's also been on um, mild to moderate depression, and I think that uh, in delivering therapies, and that, yeah, I, I think that's that's a, a pretty good area to focus on. I think that once you start thinking about, say, psychotic disorders, then you you know it's it, there, it, it's a challenging area, and I'm not sure what form a digital intervention would would take in in those particular areas. Okay. I suppose it depends a bit what I mean. Oh, sorry, Tom. Mm -hmm. well, so, so, so getting back to your, I'm getting a little. I don't know how to about that. Do you hear it? Ah, okay. Is that better? Um, what what strikes me about uh, your question around uh, these kinds of new services is they're a little bit like what uh, Uber and Lyft have done in the world of uh, transportation or Airbnb in the world of hotels. I mean, those are companies, Uber owns no cars, Airbnb owns no real estate. Uh, these are companies that have really transformed the way that business is done, and yet uh, they do it without any of the kind of classic material goods that you think you would need to compete. Well, a question I think we should be asking is, is the future of mental health care, at least some part of mental health care, still going to require bricks and mortar? And all of the things that we've built around it, um, and I also use the term paternal, paternalistic or you know, sort of top-down culture that we've assumed uh, coming out of medicine that we need to have, that we're the experts and people come for treatment because we have the information and they don't. That's not the world we live in anymore. And that's not what people are looking for, especially people under the age of 30. They become accustomed to an, a, a just-in-time, do-it-yourself, on-demand world in which they can find what they need when they want it. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous gives us a kind of model for the way that people seem to want to engage in getting care through community and through anonymous opportunities to link to others and not only to get help, but to give help. To think about doing that more broadly online at scale uh, globally is actually a pretty interesting idea. And I think that has been taken up by a few companies that have already scaled pretty successfully. I'm on the board of one called Seven Cups that now serves a million people a month. Uh, and it's pretty much grown virally about 20% month on month over the last couple of years. It's um, tiny. It doesn't have an office anywhere. It's a virtual company. They have about 200,000 listeners. They provide coaching. They provide individual psychotherapy as needed. Uh, but it's a completely different model. It is like Uber or Airbnb. And it it may not be the way this plays out in 10 years or five years, but I think they're probably closer to the future of what technology can do for this field than any of us might imagine. And it's, I say that because that is what people seem to be looking for. It's anonymous, it gives enormous access, which is 24 seven, uh, and it provides something that people are looking for, namely this kind of social connection and the sense of community with people who have similar issues and are solving these collectively. It's pretty interesting. I should also mention that it's free. So it's pretty disruptive as well, because what it does is it uh, undercuts an awful lot of what we think is essential um, in, in running mental health clinics.
we have to remember we're talking about two separate things. We're talking about mental health, mm -hmm. which is everyone, and psychiatry, which is really quite a small yeah. thing. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the idea of mobilizing social networks to help uh, people and communities is not new. And certainly, we showed off the London bombs in 2005 that uh, people who could get whose mobiles worked, because usually they don't, but when they did. Uh, straight after the bombs in London, who could immediately contact their family and friends felt better. Well, that's, you know, no shit, that was a surprise. But what the prize was, six months later, the differences in the anxiety levels were still present between those who could make immediate contact with their family and those who couldn't. And 99% of Londoners reacted by wanting to talk to someone they knew for 90% of the time and 90% of the time they, that they found it helpful. Only a tiny number needed any form of professional intervention. So there's an idea where technology did help. And we've actually changed the way we respond now to disasters in this city. Instead of trying to switch the networks off, we keep them going and you get a little text message saying, keep it short. Because we think that's actually helps people straight away. And, and, and unfortunately, we're gonna have more of these episodes and then we'll see if it makes a difference. Okay. I think one of the things we've got to be very careful about is, is being either or. Um, in my ideal future, what we would have would be uh, efficiencies made by the use of technology, which would allow for the sort of intensive care of severe mental illness, of, of people with severe mental illness, which at the moment resources simply don't permit. So for people who have psych you know, extremely difficult psychoses, uh, the psychiatrists would actually be able to spend more face time with people who need more face time. Yeah. Now, I think what we're talking about, this is a really useful way of framing it, is that this isn't a single solution, but what we're looking for is a, a platform. There's a whole range of things. Some of them will be digital, some of them won't be. But it's uh, it's building out what we've been doing to be able to be more inclusive. I think for me, getting back to your first question, yes, this helps us on the access question. The real The real challenge for us now is to improve the quality of care and to make sure that whether it's digital or face-to-face, we're doing something that's far more effective uh, and it's also more engaging. It's in line with what people want and it has better outcomes. And that, I don't think we've addressed that in a, in a really serious way, whether we're talking about the traditional system or this, this Uber, Airbnb, novel, uh, non bricks and mortar system that seems to be coming up. This, this issue of what people want um, sort of leads us into that, that area of, of data sharing and data protection. And one of the, the things which we've had in the UK is that people are actually quite sensitive about the sharing of health data. And we also know that even when people join Facebook or join Twitter and agree to certain data sharing arrangements, they can then be surprised as to how the, the, the data is then used. They, they, they've agreed to the letter of the agreement, but their view of the spirit of it is quite different. And you know, I think that's something that, that we have to be quite careful about. It, it's very easy to get excited about how much data is in a mobile phone and how much it allows you access. But uh, are people really going to be happy uh, with data being used in that way? Are people really going to be happy with uh, practitioners having access to that data? I don't know. And and you know, that that I think is going to be a challenge. Well, we had that problem, didn't we, with NHS Digital? They turned yeah. out all the apps that they were recommending yes. didn't encrypt and, and were yeah. easily. Um, yeah. Well, we had that issue with Samaritan's Radar, where... You'll have to explain what that okay. is. Yeah. Samaritan's Radar was um, a system which was um, sort of very briefly launched by Samaritans uh, in the UK who are uh, a suicide... They're the equivalent of Lifeline in the US, a suicide prevention organization. And the idea was that it was... Uh, it worked with Twitter so that if people you were following expressed suicidal thoughts, it would give you an alert and some information as to what to do about it, which on the surface of it seemed pretty benevolent and it had certainly been developed and, and focus grouped and so on. But very in a very short space of time after launching it became clear that in the, the, the wilds and the ecosystem of, of Twitter, uh, people uh, used Twitter in different ways. They didn't like the idea of their data being used in that way. They saw it as uh, intrusive, they saw it in some ways as sinister, and it, it, was, uh, it, it was an experiment which, which didn't work. That's what happens when you equate focus groups with research now. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not, yeah I mean, it's not the first time that something's been developed, yeah. which when you put it out into the ecosystem doesn't work. It's just if you do it on Twitter, it's sort of <laughs> somewhat more uh, rapid and dramatic. Yes, than, uh, as it was. Yeah, yeah. And would otherwise be. Okay. Yeah. And 
I'd like to actually switch focus now, um, if, if that's okay with everyone, and to a different topic, um, artificial intelligence and ethics and society. Um, now, it's often in the news talking about algorithms and you know um, that we need to be very cautious about the, the, the positives and the negatives of, of their applications. So, for example, um, one of the arguably positive outcomes is that it could identify peer leaders better than humans can identify peer leaders, which would have a, an enriched effect in networks to disseminate information to, uh, for example, hard to reach groups. Um, so there's been some successful research on that. Now, the flip side of this is that uh, algorithms could be used to identify people uh, to target them um, either racially or in a discriminatory manner. Um, and I would welcome uh, the audience to, to comment on, on algorithms and big data and the idea that who owns the algorithms how can people use these algorithms? For example, um, can the police access these algorithms that you've created? The prediction of these algorithms, they're not 100% accurate. Uh, these are just statistical models. So um, it, it's a very, it's a huge area of concern um, with these al algorithms. And I just wondered if anyone had any views on this. Otherwise, we could broaden this to talk about artificial intelligence. Yes. Earlier on, there was um, uh, a guy from Chicago who was talking about data mining and, and stuff like that. How, how people have, they had like a research group going, and then a bunch of guys from uh, New York went in and saw some researchers, and those researchers instantly started data mining them without their permission. And you, you've got people that could actually go around and just do that in their daily life. You know, talk to people, and we think they're having an interesting conversation with them about something. You know, they, they've got showing some concern, some empathy for my life, or whatever. But in actual fact, they're data mining us for something that is actually worth quite a lot of money to those people. And I think that kind of um, it's like uh, intellectual brain, in a sense. You know, taking that knowledge out of us without that consent without any form of even acknowledgement of this is what we're doing, you know, through innocent conversation and things like that. I think that is quite dangerous. And, and so but it's how do we educate people to understand that that thing is out there, that type of possibility is out there. And you need to look out for this, as well as educating the researchers into not doing that in the first place. Um, and I think those type of things we need to look at and, and try and educate the population that you know, what's in your head is actually yours, and, and it doesn't belong to any one group, company, individual, unless you actually give them permission to one, ask for it, two, give it to them and ask them to store it, and then give them permission to use it in X, Y, and Z, shape or form. Well, I, I just want to jump in and then open it up. But, um, I, I agree, Lloyd, that, and I think you've touched on something about empowerment and making um, care more personalized and that you are the driver of your own care and you're in it every step of the way. Um, so it's it's your big data and it's your human genome, it's your brain, everything, you know, it, it, it's you own everything. And I think it's a culture of safetyness that we need to create um, in our society and not necessarily a fear of algorithms, uh, but we need to understand that there, there are good uses and, and there are bad uses and um, for people to uh, be proactive with their care uh, and and try to personalize this experience, but I I, I don't have any answers. These are more just um, questions and concerns for, for me. I don't know if anyone else has. It certainly brings up the issue of confidentiality, doesn't it? Yeah. And you know, it's as if uh, it all the, it sort of reminds me a bit of uh, if we were a hundred years ago, we'd be talking about the subconscious. You know, that that's what you're producing. You know, this data which you're not consciously constructing a picture but someone using AI can build a picture of maybe thoughts you haven't even expressed from it. Only in this case it's not just uh, Professor Freud who can read your subconscious, mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, <laughs> anyone with the software and, and you know that's a serious concern as to, to what confidentiality means uh, in, in this world. Okay. Um, Tom, I don't know if you have any questions or, or comments. 
Well, maybe it's because I live in Silicon Valley or work in Silicon Valley anyway. It, it's uh, that it feels like this horse has already left the barn. And yeah, we all live in a world in which um, there is so little uh, privacy for what we do on, at least online. I mean, look at what we're doing right now. You know, we have no idea who's listening in and what they're doing with the information that we disseminate. So it's uh, it's a world in which uh, things are far less confidential, far less private. Uh, we, I think, as a society, amazingly, we've come to accept that, that uh, we will be getting advertisements based on the algorithms that have been derived uh, from our consumer behavior. So somebody's watching everything we purchase, everything we search, everything that we do online, and based on that is figuring out how to market to us. Uh, I find that pretty offensive, but uh, it's what it's the world we live in now. That's already happened. The question for me is, like with any technology, there are there are pluses and there are minuses, and there are always unintended consequences. And the task for us now is to understand what this can do what it can't do, and then what are the things we want to make sure it doesn't do. I, I, you know, I think, and maybe it's because of where I work and, and what I do, um, I see that the development of AI and machine learning as the most important scientific development of the last three or four decades. I, I don't think any of us have even a clue just how transformative this is going to be. Uh, when I started working at Google, the first day I was there, someone said, you know, you need to meet with the head of machine learning. And I sat down with him to say, tell me about this. He, he said, well, what do you know? I said, nothing because, or I said very little. And he said, that's good because everything has changed in the last three weeks. And, and in fact, that has been almost consistently true. This is a very, very rapidly moving field. And where we are now, a year and a half, two years later, is in a completely different world than where we were in 2015, mostly because we've gotten a better understanding of how machines can teach themselves to do new things that they've never done before. And I find that truly frightening. Uh, and when I said that, actually, in this initial meeting at Google, the head of machine learning turned to me and he said, I think you're beginning to understand. This is really this is extraordinary. Uh, so we're at an early phase of this, and someone somewhere needs to be asking, what does the end game look like? Is it like, like the movie Ex Machina, where the machine sort of just takes over and begins to rule the world? Or are we um, at a point where we still want to begin to put some breaks in, in place so that we fully understand um, what it is that the AI revolution is bringing to us? We're assuming here that machines would do a worse job than certain humans of running the world, which I'm, yeah, that was my thought yeah, as well. Yes. I'm completely convinced that would be yeah. a terrible thing. <laughs> but uh... yeah, I mean, I was there a talk recently on AI in medicine. It was quite narrow, but I certainly felt it won't be very long when we won't have any radiologists because it's quite clear that machines are going to be better at interpreting. They're going to make less mistakes interpreting cytology, pathology, uh, X or, or whatever imaging than people would be and and if i was training radiology i think i'd look for another career quite quickly but i don't actually think that's quite the same in psychiatry i think that um i'm more opti well i don't know whether it's optimistic or pessimistic but uh i'm not sure that machines will take over and i, I was we had today was the day we had our new hundred new um post uh, uh, trainees arrived i was talking to them this morning and with talking about change and neuroscience and i was talking about neuroscience but others were and what things will change and what things will stay the same. But I think one thing that probably will stay the same is people finally will want to share some of the more intimate and difficult details of their life with another human being. And I, I don't really see that changing. And if you look at the internet-based therapies, the ones that work best are the ones that have still got some connection with a human being. The ones that have no connection at all don't seem to be particularly effective. So I'm, I'm less pessimistic about that future, um, but I wouldn't do radiology. <laughs> but let me push back on that, Simon, a little bit, because, yeah, good. you know, I, I can imagine, first of all, you don't know that I truly exist. I could be, I could be an AI creature. I could be a robot, that, an avatar that's simply communicating based on how I've been programmed. 
And if you if you if you want to have some fun, there's a new uh, company called Wobot, W O E B O T, that has an online therapist, totally AI driven. That besides being pretty good at providing a sort of CBT like intervention, he's very very funny and edgy and and sort of sarcastic, which kind of tells you how how uh, clever all of this is getting. But you know, I think the bigger point is kind of what is it that it that AI, what is it that machines will do well? And what is it that humans will do well? And what we can do together. So uh, I would agree with you that, you know, for you and for me, we'd probably be more likely to divulge uh, our most intimate concerns to another person. But there are lots of people who wouldn't feel that way. And lots of people who actually would probably feel better talking to a machine than they would talking to, um, to another human. I think but for me, what's kind of interesting here is to ask where could we use this technology to do something that actually helps us on problems that we haven't been able to solve as humans. So I'm sure at this conference, there's been a lot of talk about uh, task sharing and scaling up and global mental health. We are never going to have enough well-trained humans to do the kinds of things that psychiatrists do in the UK or the US. But you could imagine providing the augmentation of what we do in a way that allows a sort of upskilling of people who have far less training. Let me give you a quick example. There are people now working on taking the phone calls that come into a suicide hotline or the texts that come into a crisis text line and using a natural language processing and machine learning algorithms, give it, getting a real time assessment of risk uh, an assessment of risk that is as good as what a master clinician would do. So this would be equivalent to somebody who's been doing this for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and yet you can hand this over to a new volunteer with maybe very little training on the suicide lifeline to be able to give them the backup they need. And if it's only even a green, yellow, red light that helps them to stratify risk in real time, that's something that might actually be quite useful. It's a very feasible project to do with the, even the algorithms we have today. And I think it's, you know, it's one example of what we want, which is finding the place where putting humans and machines together becomes a better process, a higher quality process than either one of them alone. A question, Tom, do you think that humans can form therapeutic relationships with AI? You know, I think that's a great empirical question. Um, and I think we'll have the answer fairly soon. I think there are now... In the next three weeks? <laughs> <laughs> the question is whether the machines will tell us or not. They, they may decide that we don't need to know that. Um, <laughs> You're a very scary person, Tom. You really are. <laughs> Well, that, that is based on a little bit of experience here. I think it'll be interesting to discover that. And I guess maybe, a, you know, a simple way to weasel out of your question with a slightly iffy answer is to say that I do think there are people with um, on the autism spectrum who will probably find it easier to relate to um, a machine than they will to a human, whether that's a therapeutic alliance whether that proves to be as effective or not, um, I don't know. But these are the sorts of questions I think we should all be trying to grapple with. And then, you know, thinking about so what kind of machine would be most helpful, and for whom, and how would we develop it, and how would we measure impact? Uh, those kinds of questions I think are real right now, and they're, they're questions we can begin to to wrestle with. <coughs> I actually think there are quite some good examples for that already. So I don't know if you ever heard of this robot dog um, that's used in Japan, for example, for Alzheimer patients. So kind of um, just a robot that creates a person in the morning and, and, that, and just by that um, already creates some kind of um, um, a relation that, that can be very benefiting. For, uh, you probably all know the, those cleaning robots. So personally, um, I really felt how 
I kind of get emotionally connected to them, just like I would to a dog when you're sitting in front of your desk and then suddenly this robot is coming up and touching your feet very gentle and think, oh, what's that? Oh, it's a robot again. So, it doesn't pee on the carpet either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's much easier to handle. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think we've got to be quite careful here because psychiatry, the history of psychiatry is filled with things which seemed intuitively obvious, mm. which seemed like great ideas. And Simon, of course, your work on uh, post-trauma counseling, yeah. which intuitively seems like a great idea. And then in the Cochrane Review years ago, now you, you the, the evidence and said, well, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Yeah. And I think we've got to be careful of the trap of developing technological interventions with the unspoken assumption that they're bound to work because they're intuitively good ideas, and neglecting the opportunity to, to collect data on, on effectiveness. Yeah, that's right. And we should also remember, you know, there's a kind of adventure in two worlds happening here. Here, you're a very, unlike me, a much more savvy audience, and Tom's got amazing you know, ideas and, and, and projects going on. I'm in, in another world that I work in, in, interacting with governments at the moment, there's a kind of moral panic around social media. That social media is the cause of the rise in mental health problems, particularly in young people. It needs to be regulated. The big story yesterday was on the regulation of social media, uh, and that will continue. So there is, you know, within within a few yards of where we're speaking, quite a lot of people with a lot of power who think it's gone too far, that um, it's it's creating mental health problems. I, I frankly don't actually, but a lot of people do, and that's another very powerful discourse, very big Daily Mail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And most people seem to just take it for granted. Well, obviously, social media is the cause of the rise of eating disorders and anxiety disorders in young people. Um, so that's a, a separate discussion going on at the same time as the discussions Tom's having uh, with Google. So, oh, yes, please. No. Um, I don't think it's the point of social media is the thing that is creating the problem. It's the people that are using social media that are creating the Problem. Um, you know, there's actually a group on there that are convincing people to go around and commit suicide, but using social media as a portal to do that. I'm, 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 not, I'm not arguing with them, uh, disputing that. I'm saying that there is a very strong voice among elected politicians, commentators, um, you know, whatever you wish to call them, you know, London elite if you want, it doesn't matter, who do think social media is the problem causing a rise in mental health problems. I don't think we know. Okay, but there's definitely very strong voices uh, arguing that. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say, do you not think that social media has kind of like highlighted um, and raised more awareness on the society that um, London culture of mental health? So, whereas we probably been trying to put a blanket um, over the whole, like, you know, we're, we've got the best NHS, we've got the best counselors, we've got the best schools, but technically, you know, when social media did cover that, the rise of the social media phenomena happened, but we actually saw that there was loads of people coming out speaking about mental health. So I think that social media, um, I do what you're saying, is not actually, um, people would argue, but I think it's just just ignorant to the fact that we didn't realise that these things were going on anyway. It's just the fact that people are talking and they are using the reasons. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably not in agreement with yeah. you, but I'm just saying that probably at the moment, I would think the majority of people aren't, actually. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, Sorry, um, going back to the AI um, conversation, uh, they are actually quite afraid of AI, I believe. Um, I am now. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I mean, we're assuming that the AI, because they're machines, they're going to be better than us at performing these tasks. But um, if we're talking about um, you know, psychiatry, uh, what happens if the AI advances to the, to the level that it's human-like and starts to develop its own Mental health problems. Mm. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Tom can help us here. Tom, we're stuck. We need to go in. Really brilliant insight. <laughs> so, Tom, but on a serious note, um, you know, it seems as though. Uh, I'll just come back to me. It seems as though there might be some fractured thinking here in terms of how healthcare is going to operate and use technology to supplement their intentions, um, how technology is going to storm ahead using these incredible algorithms that can predict most things before they happen. Um, and, and then we have other uh, fractured ventures happening. So 
Um, is this just the the sorry state of things? Am I being too pessimistic that we're all sort of um, going on our own uh, and trying to feel our way through the dark or choosing a camp, so to speak? Um, because how, how is it even possible to bring everyone together and to unite healthcare structure with technology? Um, th this is a very theoretical question um, that I'd like everyone to answer, but but Tom, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, so I'll start, Becky. I, I just don't see it that way. I, that, I do think you're looking at it in a, a sort of a glass half empty way. I, to me, this is a time of extraordinary opportunity. And the way I think about it, uh, and again, this is just my bias, but uh, when I look at where we have failed in psychiatry, and I do believe we failed, I don't think we have much that we can point to as a raging success. But for me, the biggest failure is our failure to measure what we do. That uh, we don't we don't account for very much. There's a an old saying that you what you don't measure, you don't manage, or you can't manage what you can't measure. And I think in this field, uh, that has been a, an enormous problem. Uh, the, for me, the opportunity with technology is that it allows us to begin to account for things. It allows us to measure when people are getting better, when they're getting worse, how we're doing with interventions, when we need to increase or decrease whatever it is we do. And, and for the first time to manage better in the world of healthcare and potentially in the world of self-help and what we do online for large populations. So I'm actually quite hopeful. And I think by starting with this foundation of better measurement, uh, we should be able to begin to see better outcomes. And that's just with the interventions we have right now. You can then begin to layer on that lots of other kinds of opportunities. So yes, there's always some fear with every new tool that comes out of the shed and there's new, you know, the possibility of things uh, being used in ways that are going to make people worse and not better. Uh, but I'm kind of on the half full side. I think this is a time of, uh, a fantastic opportunity and what is exciting to me is that rather than requiring the high tech of genomics and the high tech of, of neuroimaging, this is really pretty low tech and it and it scales so quickly and it could be free. So I think this is exciting. Now, there are a lot of questions that still need to be answered, but if we're measuring as we go, we should be able to get answers as well. Can I also just say for the record, I'm half full, but I'm trying to be a, a, the moderator here. Uh, but but I'm with you on that. And I, and I do think that this is an opportunity for people to, to empower themselves with a social um, data. And we can't really look at our genomes and, and uh, methylate our risk variants and, you know, switch off the connectivity in our prefrontal cortex that we're concerned about. But we can certainly prune our, our, <laughs> prune our friendship networks um, and make decisions and have choices and empower ourselves to uh, to sort of uh, make different social choices and so I, I agree that I think it's very exciting that this is um, a shift in in responsibility and care for the individual uh, so I, I do agree it's very exciting but I'm gonna now pass it over to the audience um, I had a question when we were talking about Sorry. social media um, what and and Dr. Inzel sort of already mentioned this, but uh, in the advent of so much more data available, so much more real-time um, mental health issues surfacing online, how do you envision the changes in being able to measure the impact of interventions or even just measure how many people are being affected by different mental health issues? Um, because that is such a difficult question with what we have now traditionally in psychiatry. Um, do you already have ideas of how this new data and these new available platforms will change that? Well, I, I think um, I'm not, I have to say, as, as, as pessimistic maybe as, as Tom about what psychiatry has achieved. Um, but I would say that being a psychiatrist is uh, a little bit like being uh, an infectious diseases specialist without the microscope that uh, we have these conditions that we refer to as mental illnesses. We have treatments. We don't know what treatment will always work for whom. Um, our, our 
uh, prognostication, say, in the matter of uh, prodromal um, psychosis is, is, you know, it's very, very difficult. Risk prediction is extremely difficult. And I think that the approach which has been taken thus far is the idea that if you understand, as you were saying, Becky, the genetics and the neuroscience, you can then move towards maybe uh, tailoring treatments and personalizing treatments for individuals. What digital can do, I think, are, are two things. The first thing is that it can enable us to analyze, um, say, uh, brain scans uh, with far greater power and, and precision. The other thing is that it does provide a stream of additional information which might enable us might possibly enable us to predict and tailor treatments. So for instance, at the moment, in terms of psychosis, uh, we know that you might need clozapine for psychosis if two other antipsychotics that we've given have not worked. Mm -hmm. So if you have what is referred to as treatment-resistant psychosis, we know that because we've given you uh, a good number of months of a treatment which hasn't worked. And we've got to be able to do better than that. And it's possible, as I say, that the data, maybe from um, demographic data, maybe uh, through uh, greater precision interpretation of, of uh, scans and so on, will allow us to do that, to find out which people need which treatment sooner and, and just cut out a lot of the trial and error at the moment, which I think is, is, is most difficult for patients, actually. I want to go one step further. Uh, uh, I think Tom would agree with me on this one that uh, the, the, the stupid phones that we carry around uh, give us an additional real-time way cheaper picture there that's supplemental yeah. to the neuroscience mm -hmm. engine, supplemental yeah. to what we can find in the healthcare system. Uh, and it's the, the, the power there is really incredible. It's super, super cheap. And that's the thing that I think really, really democratizes it and makes it available mm -hmm. broadly. And the hope, the hope you could actually <laughs> from being a one that's diagnose and treat to eventually being in a world where it's predict and preempt. Uh, and, and at that point, uh, I think we will get much better public health outcomes. Part of what is such a challenge, besides the fact that we don't measure what we do, is that we get to the game very late in psychiatry. Um, that used to be true in cardiology as well. We've had much better outcomes in heart disease because we've gone upstream and we've begun to realize how we can predict and preempt because we understand risk in a much more precise way. Um, we need to do that for psychosis. Um, we, we should be in a world where we're now thinking about how to predict psychosis, not how to treat it after someone's been ill for three or four or five years and already become quite disabled. Okay, thank you. Um, now I want to switch focus to the concept of engagement and when we approach individuals with particular ideas or, or tools, um, how, how do we best approach people and are we going to scare people away with technology? Um, do we just throw a bunch of tools at them? Here's a bot, uh, here's some, some other various uh, things. How, how do we engage with people? Um, is there research on this and are there successful approaches and what are your views on how best to connect with people because especially with young people you might only get one shot um, and who is the best person to be approaching them um, what is the face of the future will it be technology will it be healthcare will it be a peer you know I just love to know everyone's views on on that just from my personal experience working with young people I would say to go directly to the organizations that they may maybe um, connect with. So like, for example, like um, working with Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and getting it, um, and pushing it through those mediums where they understand most. They don't want to see people on the news or people like us sitting down talking about their futures. So rather than finding a dialogue, which they already understand, and using those mediums, rather than trying to find new, um, intervention in new organizations, maybe working with the current leaders that already allow young people to express. So uh, don't tarnish them, don't throw them out, bring them in and maybe just have a bigger dialogue. I think. Well, actually, um, I'm speaking as a young person here, and that is, young people don't know rooms like need to exist, whether all these mental health professionals and they're discussing on this issue, but they have no idea, all, all they know from their perspective is that they're going through some shit, they're going through some mental health issues, and they don't know what to do about it. So I think 
the key thing we have to focus on there is not the provision of the services or like the creation of the services, but getting it to them. So the way we would pro probably do that the best would be through phones, because almost every young person has a phone on them. As Vivi said, um, they're very familiar with Instagram, Snapchat, and if we manage to advertise these, I think advertisement is the key issue here because a lot of people don't know that they even exist, and a lot of people don't know about their effectiveness either. Because the nature of mental health issues is that while people, a lot of people suffer from them, a lot of people also don't like to talk about them because they think it makes them look weak. So um, it's a combination of advertisement and destigmatization. I think that makes sense. Well, it's coming from as well making it more friendly and um, I think um, relatable so and people are using these mediums anyway so I think it's just a matter of connecting maybe Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, all of these mediums have that ideology and why people blame those organizations for creating more mental health issues but really are we not seeing that they're kind of regulating the space that we can actually look at and point our fingers to blame because they are doing something that we can actually look at and measure you know I think that's mm -hmm. I think uh, an important thing that's emerged from this conference is um, the need to keep humans in the loop, and, and not just with the um, uh, beginning aspects of any research process, but throughout. Um, and, and how do we keep people engaged? And, and, um, in social work, we say we have a phrase of uh, um, start with where people are, um, but being able to understand and utilize that idea that. Um, starting point to engage people, I think it's really important. So, for example, in, in um, our work, we quickly realize that we can't just have young people as interpreters and translators of social media content because um, they're not actively shaping the intervention that comes after that. So, how do we keep them engaged? Well, first, we need to be aware of the ways in which they're engaging community. And so, for example, in our work, we had two young people that were gang involved that were interpreters and translators of the social media content we were accessing, um, but they had life things happening to them throughout the process. One person had um, a child born, uh, um, uh, uh, another one had a, a tremendous amount of uh, family issues that impacted their ability to um, engage us. So being uh, flexible, and reflexive, I think, is a really um, important piece of that engagement to persist, not just to initiate. I'd like to agree on Desmond's point there and also uh, add that I think it's very important to get the established authorities involved. So, um, in the healthcare system, that would be, for example, um, for the mental health psychiatrist or the GPs to really um, educate those people and push that technology also through the established systems. Um, oh, sorry, just in the back. Um, I, I, I guess I just want to add to the point Tom was making and, and push and follow on from that. Um, these platforms um, are definitely engaging more users to enable access, but the traditional way of delivering care, especially in psychiatry, Probably across health, it's, it's a regulated way of delivering care. It's at a country level, at a jurisdiction level, um, and, and those are there for valid reasons to prevent adverse events. So, so the question, I guess, is how would you um, deliver global mental health? In other words, um, allow resources to work across jurisdictions, nations, uh, using these this disruptive platforms, um, and in, and, and at the same time, the platforms being run by a Silicon Valley based company, who would, who would buy that and how would, who would lead um, bringing these things together, which are really different moving parts? Um, to me, it looks like they're in cats in some ways. Okay. Tom, any thoughts? Engagement is a huge issue. Uh, the only thing I could add to what's already been said is um, one thing that I've learned in the last few years, uh, maybe the last year to be more precise, is the um, that a lot of it has to do with the word you used a couple of times uh, today, Becky, which is the word empowerment. And I think that in psychiatry, uh, our tradition has been 
to put the power in the hands of the provider uh, and to not recognize the opportunity to empower the people that we call patients. I mentioned before uh, my work with Seven Cups, which is this, you know, one of these um, kind of more community uh, focused, anonymous free services that scaled very quickly. I think they're doing something interesting, but what their secret seems to be from what I can learn from them about engagement is that they, they bring people onto their site and very quickly you go from someone who's looking for help to someone who's providing help to somebody else. And when you're thinking about what empowers people, there is nothing more empowering than giving someone the opportunity to help another person. We don't do that in psychiatry very well. We do it a little bit within the group therapy context, but not enough. Um, that's the kind of thing that we can do through these new platforms uh, that I think will be engaging. And again, we, we can find that out because we can measure as we go. We can learn what it is that people want to do what they continue to do and what they've found most most empowering so these are all now empirical questions before they were theoretical ones and that's part of why i'm so excited about this new opportunity I agree with that i mean i think that's the way things have been going anyway for uh, in spite of well, well without the technology you mentioned what we did years ago on showing that uh, single session debriefing was ineffective by professionals after trauma actually made you worse, the result of which we changed the systems with the military to build up a very big network of peer practitioners who were soldiers themselves wearing uniforms, et cetera, et cetera, has been the kind of first line of defense. And, and that's now the system we use. So I think that's the way we have been moving, actually. I'm slightly more optimistic than Tom in the sense that we have been doing that. But at the end of the day, there are some people who are too ill to to uh, traumatized etc will then need more so that well and, and and the system is supposed to pick those up and then the ones who really do need more will go on to the next level and and that's done actually without technology but it will be made easier for sure with technology. yeah i'm not i agree i think that, that we've got to be very careful about this idea of um totally disruptive innovation Mm. I know that's a sort of fashionable to think thing to think about, but I think that we've, we've got to think about how um, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, social workers, everyone involved in uh, the mental health team can have their practice enhanced by technology yeah, sure. and assisted by technology. I think if what we're saying is is full repl is replacement, I think that's that's no. not simply not realistic. And I, we're coming to the end, but just one last cautionary word: in, in my research world of epidemiology. Um, we have the potential to do amazing stuff in this country, but we've been hampered for some time now by the, the, the scandal of care, of care data, which people in this room will know about, and where we have the technology which would provide amazingly good information that would dramatically improve healthcare. We're basically not able to use it because people are very concerned, and I work in one trust, half a mile away is another trust. I have no idea. What my patients are doing in that other trust i cannot get their records i cannot see anything about them at all i can see the building from my office but i do not know what goes on there and we do not take to share because of tremendous concerns that have risen and i suspect the the barriers to to, uh, to coming to some of the the kind of broad some uplands that many people have been talking about will lie in culture in fear and concerns around confidentiality governance regulation, I think, will prove more tricky than we think. And I think also we've got to think about adverse events. Yes, you know, <laughs> things will go wrong. Yeah, Whatever things, happens, things, things will go wrong. Things will go wrong, <laughs> things will go wrong unexpectedly. Yeah. Yeah. The and there'll and be inquiries yep. and calls for new regulations, mm -hmm. new this, mm -hmm. there will be. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, yeah, actually, just one question, I think, for the panel. Uh, uh, Becky, uh, this linked to your question around access. Uh, I think in our earlier sessions, we had a very interesting, um, I think, two schools of thought which came out saying, how do you determine what a patient gets, what kind of therapy or what kind of help? Um, and one school of thought is let the patient decide or let the user decide, I think, as Tom said. And the other is let the clinician decide. Because there is a certain pathway which needs to be created and then made available. Uh, to the patient, and uh, I think if you if you take a utopian view of technology, then you say let the user design and caveat emptor. Uh, whereas on the other side, you say no, but this needs to be very carefully managed and controlled. And where do you think uh, the future lies? 
Well, I think one day one of those nice dogs under your desk will bite you. And then, <laughs> then we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I think it's got to be a supportive decision. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't have to be the uh, client that the individual decides or the physician decides. I think that you've got to, to make an informed decision. Data oh, can the inform middle the way. Physician. Yeah, the <laughs> middle way. But data can inform the physician better and the uh, physician can inform the patient because this is, I mean, mental health care is a humane interaction. We can't lose sight of that. Absolutely. Uh, doesn't but, final thought yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that if you've already answered this, but I'm wondering what might be the implications for communities and individuals that don't have access to psychiatry. So we're, um, uh, I work in communities where no, like, no of, of course, there's a stigma around psychiatrists and anything around uh, mental health, but there is a lack of awareness of what a mental health challenge could be at all. Um, and so what might this you know, increase in utility of visual health, how might that impact uh, disadvantaged uh, communities and how might we be able to work around that? That's kind of a question I'm going you know, to pose to everyone, basically. Okay. And, and sort of just to jump on that a little bit, the idea of you know, waiting for the clinician to tell you, for example, what music you should listen to. Um, you know, it sounds absurd, but, you know, waiting, to, you know, should I use this bot? Should I use this or the other? Um, it, it sounds a little less. It sounds more technical and, and complicated. Um, so, yeah, I think time time will tell, really. And we all have our, our decisions made to some extent, which way we'd like to go. Um, and I think we'll, we'll all start to we'll see this unfold. Um, so, I just wanted to wrap up by thanking everyone in the audience, um, as well as yourself, Tom. I don't know if you've got any final words you'd like to leave us with. Uh, um, thank first, you. thank you for including me and allowing me to uh, to join you remotely. This is uh, in some ways frustrating because I missed the whole conference, so I didn't get anything from this interaction. But hopefully, I've given you a little bit to think about uh, today, which is good. I, my, my final thought is that this, these are early days, and I think we all have to sort of think carefully about where this is going. It's starting to evolve in new and interesting ways. Um, I think this field is going to be quite different in five to ten years. Just remember, ten years ago, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have the iPhone. I mean, all of this has really happened in the last decade. A decade from now, we could be in a very different world with uh, quite different opportunities. But it's, it's a time when we really ought to be all thinking together about many of these complicated issues, uh, issues around privacy, issues around what do machines do, what do humans do, how do we bring them together, and what kind of system do we want to create uh, going forward? We, need, we have agency here. We need to have these conversations like you've been having the last couple of days everywhere, and, and in a much deeper and, and more thoughtful way to sort of take charge of where this is going and to realize that it's you know governments are always the 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 last agency to work uh, this is the chance for us as as both consumers and as providers to get out in front and to do some experiments to figure out what works what doesn't who's benefiting who isn't and then to shape this in a way that's going to be most effective for as many people as possible. It's exciting. And I think uh, this meetings like this are really beginning to now just define the agenda, which is really important to do. So Becky, thanks so much for bringing us all together. Pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure. And I want to thank you as well, Tom, and Simon, Niall, as well as the audience. Uh, I'm sure we're going to actually carry on this discussion all day long on the hashtag um, but thank you all and goodbye to everyone around the world who's also watched live okay thank you, thank you.